we're going along, uh, you know, please feel free to just, just ask me. Uh, and then afterwards, if you have any questions uh, after this class is over, most of you know where you can find me, but my office is uh, 216D, just a couple doors down from Dr. Jenny's office. Uh, so please feel free after today, if you have any other questions, come and find me. I'll be happy to help you. So looking at statistics and what we're actually doing here, we can see that the purpose of statistics, who thinks or who knows what the purpose of statistics is, besides just to torment you? Like to show results of something? To show results of something, what else? That is true, yeah. Compare data. Yeah, so to, to compare data, to show results, it's essentially that part of the article that has all the numbers, has equations, tables, those kind of things. But the, I guess the official definition would be to collect, organize, classify, present, and then interpret data. So it's kind of doing a little bit of everything. It's involved from the minute you start collecting data, however you're planning on doing that, through surveys, uh, what, what, whatever it is, and then organizing it, and then getting different types of information out uh, when, when you present and then interpret. So if this is our purpose, I've always found it helpful to start with an example. And so free throw shooting in sports psychology, which is my area, uh, is really, really studied, maybe even overstudied. But it's helpful here with statistics, just looking at some, some simple examples. So the problem that I'm going to present you with and what we're going to work through is if a basketball player if a pre-shot imagery effect, you don't have to know anything of what that means, uh, affects free throw shooting. So if this sports psychology principle, if it can help somebody actually shoot a free throw and shoot it better than they did before they, be, be, before they did the imagery. So the way we would organize this, again, very simple. We're going to have two teams. Uh, each team has got nine players. We're going to have an experimental team that's going to be doing this brand new... Uh, Thing, and then we're, we're going to have a control team that's not going to do anything. They're just going to go through however they shoot free throws. So this might look similar to how you are doing your own study. So then how do I know if the imagery training worked? So I could probably just look at the team and say, okay, well that team looks like they're shooting better than this team. But statistics will actually help to show you, did this work better than just by chance? And that's really what statistics is trying to help you understand. Because by chance, somebody could shoot more than another person, but we need to know if it's statistically better than just by your 50-50 coin flip chance. So that's what we are trying to figure out, and that's what statistics is trying to help you with in whatever uh, question you have that you're trying to work with. So in order to get through this, we have what I like to call the simple checklist. We have to have a hypothesis, which we all have, right? Yes. Oh, thank you, JP. <laughs> <laughs> One person's paying attention, Dr. Jane. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> then we're going to collect data, which you have a plan for. Then you're going to analyze data, which you have to develop your plan for. And then you have to interpret the results, which you're not going to get to this step with your, with your uh, project here but you can at least kind of see how it all fits together. So the hypothesis, null and alternative. Did we go over this? Yes? Yep. Okay, good, good. So my null hypothesis for my little experiment then is there is no significant difference uh, in the completed free throws uh, between the two groups. Pretty simple, standard null hypothesis. So my alternative, let's see if I get this little thing out of the way, is that there is a significant difference. Again, very simple experimental design. So I have my null and my alternative. The reason we make you do a null and an alternative is for statistics, because what these statistical tests are going to try and do is they're going to see if we can prove the null true. That's what we're actually trying to do. So we're trying to see, is the null true? And if our tests say no, then we can accept the alternative and reject the null. So that's why we have you write a null and an alternative. It's not just you know, to make you write two hypotheses that look almost the same. There is a reason for it, uh, and this is why. Okay, so we have our hypothesis number one. So then I'm going to collect data, 
uh, you know, I go out there, I do everything uh, between my, my two teams, and this is my initial result. So this is, you know, number two in our checklist. Okay, so now we have to analyze the data. We have it all in. What are we going to do? Why does this matter? Is our things working? So descriptive statistics is the first type of statistics we're going to look at. And this is something you've probably worked on before you've read. These are the things that are really easy to understand. This is describing the data, such as uh, height uh, of your players, the age of your players, the free throw percentage of your players, whatever it is to just describe what it is, the average um, age, I think I might have said that already. So just what does your data look like? What, you're, you're kind of painting a picture. So that's describing your data. That's descriptive statistics. Number two is inferential statistics. And this is when we're actually trying to get a conclusion. We're trying to actually understand, is team one different than team two? Is my imagery group different than my control group? And that's what this is trying to actually come about. When you're reading all of those long uh, journal articles, these statistics are usually the ones that are a little harder to understand. Uh, they kind of have all of the jargon built in and everything. So we're going to start with descriptive. Descriptive, like I said, is easy. We have measures of central tendency. Have we looked at this already? No. Okay. So this are things you probably learned in hopefully basic math, maybe reaching back to high school. Anybody had a statistics course here before? Okay, one, two. No, just one. Okay, who here has at least looked at this in like a math course at some point? Mean, median, mode, okay. So this is not foreign language to you. All right, mean, average, median, what's the middle value? Uh, and then the mode is the most frequently occurring value. Hopefully all review. There will be exam questions on that for sure. You should know that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So this is my imagery group. My mode would be two, because there's three twos. So that's the most frequently occurring number. Uh, my median would be three. And then my mean would be 3.2. Now, why would it be of value to know both, let's say, the median and the mean? Why do we think? If, if, if we have these numbers up here, and we have our medians three, and our mean is 3.2. If I just showed you the mean of 3.2, could that, uh, why, why would that, or could that be problematic? What do we think? I don't understand the point of having a median value and a median. Okay, so VJ doesn't know why we have a median. Uh, so let's go over here, and I'll show, I'll show you why a median can be important. Let's go with salary. Let's say I get a group of people, and I say the average salary of this group of people is, let's say, $50,000. That gives you an idea of the group of people, maybe what job they have, something like that. But let's say, so this is the mean. This can be problematic if I survey, let's say, 100 people that had a average salary of, no, let's say out of 100 people, 99 people had an average salary of $1,000, and one person had an average salary of a $1 million. And so I don't, that probably doesn't average to $50,000. let us say it did. So if I just showed you the mean, all of a sudden you have an idea of the group. But this idea is very different, whereas if the median now, I say, is $1,000, you're like, what the heck is the difference? Like, why is our mean and our median so different? So that's why the median is important. A lot of times, in a perfectly distributed world, and we'll get to that in a second, the mean, median, and mode are all the same number. But when they're not the same number, that means our data uh, is a little strange, and that's why it's important to have both. Does that help answer your question? Okay. So... If I were to write up this, the, the descriptive statistics, and you might have seen this or something similar, I would say the imagery group averaged 3.2 free throws, the control group averaged 2.4 free throws. So right off the bat, I see that there's a difference, and I think, hey, this is great, my imagery program worked. But I don't know that just off the descriptive statistics, because 
I only surveyed how many people? Who remembers? Yeah, 18 total, so there were nine each, each group. So that could be an issue because I only surveyed nine people for my imagery group. These nine people could have just gotten better on their own. They could have uh, just had a lucky day when, when they were shooting free throws. Uh, the control group could have just had an unlucky day. So just looking at this without running any other statistics could be problematic. But we actually love to just pull statistics from descriptive statistics and say that there's a difference when really we don't know yet. Um, so that's what we're going to try and see with uh, other statistics in just a second. The last thing I want to share with descriptive is what we call measures of variability. This is how much does our mean vary person to person. So we have something called variance which I don't know if you have to know that, uh, but it's the expected square deviation from the mean. It's a complicated statistical term. Uh, what is more relevant is the standard deviation. Have we heard of a standard deviation? Good. Okay, good. So the standard deviation, the actual mathematical term is it's a root mean square deviation from the mean, but essentially it's, if we have a, uh, you've ever seen a normal curve before, if this is our mean, one standard deviation encompasses about 67% of the sample. So that means if I have a mean of $50,000 with a standard deviation of $1,000, that means 67-ish percent of our sample has a salary between $49,000 and $51,000. So it just shows how, how much does it range within your sample. Now, if we had something like this, our $1,000 and our $50,000 mean and our median of $1,000, we might have something like a standard deviation of $40,000. So that means you know, our uh, sample ranges from you know, $10,000 to $90,000, and so that's really variable. That means there is not a lot of consistency. And so to make this a little easier to understand, we usually do what we call a range, which is the 25th and 75th percentile. When you took the SATs or something like that, you, you, you've got a percentile ranking. You know, you score, if you're like me, you score like in the 50th percentile, which isn't exactly uh, great. Uh, but that, that means that 50% did worse than you, 50% did better than you. So that's what the percentiles mean. That 25 percentile, 25th percentile, 25 were less, 75 were more, and then opposite for the same. I know there's a lot of information, bear with me, it will all make sense in the end. So this is where it becomes important. How do we get confident that we are getting something that is true? You might have heard that, you know, you can make statistics say whatever you want them to say. That's to a certain extent. But if you can actually start to get the, the mean and then actually test the mean, then we actually start to get to some truth, instead of just bending in any way that we want. Uh, and so that's where this 95% confidence interval comes in. Uh, again, I don't think you would have to know this, you might, but this is just to kind of get you comfortable with this language. So when you're maybe reading a study or you hear somebody say something, a 95% confidence interval, what it's saying is that we are 95% confident that our mean is within this range. $49,000 to $51,000. So just kind of be aware of that. When you hear confidence interval, uh, pay attention to what the number is. And the higher the confidence interval, the more certain they are. So I was kind of making, uh, I, was, I was showing you this already uh, with my drawing. That looks much better. So one standard deviation is the 68%. Two standard deviations is like 96%, 95%. And then if you see three standard deviations, they're almost certain that all answers fall within that. And then if you have an outlier, if you've heard of outliers, outliers mean they are, with, they are not encompassed in like these three standard deviations. So you would have an outlier somewhere over here. So our million dollar salary would be an outlier in our sample. And a lot of times what we like to do is kind of get rid of outliers. They don't make the sample look nice, so we kind of dismiss them as abnormal. Whether that's the right thing to do or not is up for debate, but just so you know. 
Okay, so with our standard deviations within our little example, I calculated them for you uh, so we can kind of see that the imagery group is a little less consistent than our control group. We have more variability, more range. So then we have our confidence interval. Okay. So what we need to see is, does this even matter? Did we do better than chains? Did we do better than flipping a coin? This is going to be a hint that if it crosses zero, it's not, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. So when we have variability, it means that our means are farther apart. The more variability, the more our means are probably farther apart. And when we have these curves, these curves kind of get wider and wider. Uh, and so, I'm sorry, the means are not farther apart, the standard deviations are farther apart, the means can be the same. So here's an example. If I test a thousand people, I'm going to have a thousand scores. So if I test a thousand people shooting free throws, I'm going to have a thousand scores. That means my variability is probably going to be really low, because after a thousand people you start to see everything. But like with me, in this study I only sampled nine people, ten people, so my variability is going to be much higher, even though the mean is exactly the same. So the more people you sample, the less variability. Which Dr. Jenny might have said, you want to sample as many people as you can. That's why. The more people, the better. Okay. All right, last thing I'm going to cover with you is what we call inferential statistics. The descriptive statistics was just telling you about the sample, how variable it was, how much did it vary from, uh, from one mean to the other. This one is actually going to say, is this meaningful? Should we actually pay attention to it? And the way I like to say it is, is the signal outdoing the noise that's out there in the stack? You don't need to know, I don't think, the actual what this t-test is, but this t-test is uh, what we do to compare means to see if they are statistically significant in their difference. So if we were to run all of these things, we could actually see, yes, the mean is different between group A and group B, and that's better than chance, or it's not different from group A and group B, and it's not better than chance, and we shouldn't think that this is a beneficial program. So we have something, when I actually did the t-test, we get something called a p-value. Does anybody recognize p-values from anywhere back in, in life? Did you over p-values? Uh, no, but they should have read them in their articles. Oh, good. Okay. Anybody know what p-values are? Yes, no. Probability. Probability of what? <laughs> no. no, that's good. That's good. So a p-value typically, we, we like to say the p-value should be less than 0 0.05. Where we got that was kind of pulled out of thin air, uh, but essentially it's, it's the probability uh, that your uh, null hypothesis, so the one that says that there's, that there's actually no difference, it's a probability that it is kind of false under certain conditions. And so the more, uh, or the, the lower the p-value is, essentially the better, and we want to see a p-value under 0 0.05. Because that basically means our probability is 5% or less, uh, which is a good thing. So we want to see a p-value of under 0 0.05. So what does this mean? 0.36. Too much. Too much. That's not what we want to see. So the p-value, here's the official definition for you, the probability of obtaining the observed results, or more extreme values when the null hypothesis is actually true. So that means if the null hypothesis is true, what does that mean? What, what, was, what was the null hypothesis? There would be no difference. That there would be no difference. So that means if there would be no difference, and we still got this result, or more extreme, that's the percentage. So if, it, so if we have 5% or less, let's say, then that would be acceptable. That means it's pretty rare that that would happen. To, take an exceptional circumstance, an exceptional individual, to make that happen. But if we have a p-value of 0.36, 
Well, that probability is a little higher. That means it's happening more often, and our null hypothesis is probably more true than it is false. So we have a 36% chance of obtaining the observed results when the null hypothesis is actually true. That's a pretty high percentage um, to be confident that the null hypothesis is not true. So we wouldn't, what we would call, reject the null. So when you're looking at articles, when you're reading in your textbooks, and you see something that says 0 0.05, you want to kind of pay attention to that. If you see something that says 0 0.06, that's kind of close, but not quite there. If you see something above 0 0.05, that means we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. That means there's not enough evidence to say that there's a meaningful difference between the two programs. So we fail to reject the null in this case. Oops. All right, so I kind of flew through this. Like I said, when I took um, multiple statistics courses on each one of those subjects, uh, so this is by no means supposed to make you an expert. Uh, this is more just to hopefully uh, expose you to some more of the language, to give you some more of the descriptive statistics, especially the mean, median, and mode, and then to plant the idea of these t-tests, these p-values, what they mean, why they're important, why you should be paying attention to them, and most importantly, why you should not just skip over the methods and the results section of a, of a journal article which I know a lot of people are tempted to do uh, when they are reading through. Are there any particular questions that came up as you were listening? Hopefully you were all listening. JP's an expert. Test you at 2 o'clock. Oh, that's a <laughs> All right. Do you have any questions? Nope. Go back over? This video is about to go viral when I put it online. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Uh, let's thank Dr. Sherry for coming in. Appreciate it.